Ever notice how often the littlest of things can just brighten our day? Every Thursday since arriving here at Holy Spirit, which is now just about 10 years ago, I have started my morning at Panera. As one of the regulars, most of the counter folk know my regular order. Coffee with ham, egg white, and cheese breakfast sandwich on wheat. I then grab my usual seat near the fireplace and then begin to work on my Sunday message. Well, beginning might not be the right word. I actually begin working on the weekly message much earlier as I prepare for a lectionary group that meets here on the fourth Monday of every month. Our study group looks at the readings ahead in context and seeks to discern the common message they share that then ties together the messages we hear on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> then each Monday, I begin to focus my attention on the weekly readings and the notes from that session. And occasionally, although not as often as I used to, sitting in on another study group on Tuesday afternoons with area clergy. But it is on Thursday mornings at Panera when I really begin to put my thoughts to paper. And sitting there alone with my collar, I realize I'm a visible presence of the church in their midst. And over the years, I have been blessed by several folks, many folks, coming up to me to talk to me about this or about that. And while it shouldn't be, it is often so amazing how when doing so, we have talked about something those weekly readings have revealed. If not for the Sunday message that I'm writing, something in life that it matters to the person I meet. And when this happens, I offer a short prayer and just give thanks. That, well, in a way that the kids know, and some of the youth in the back who've been with me on mission, they know my prayer. Thank you, Jesus. See, they never know if I'm being happy about it or being, oh, thank you, Jesus. But they know. This week, as I sat there thinking about how to introduce the, the, the theme for this month, the cook brings over my breakfast sandwich. And I know this is going to sound silly, but I looked at it, and it was beautiful. The bread was toasted just right. And the egg and the ham and the cheese and the bread were all stacked perfectly. It looked and tasted just so good. I regretted not taking a picture of it before having ate it. Setting aside my plate, I, I picked up my notes and read again the first line in our reading from James. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. It is then that I thank Jesus for brightening my day through something as simple as a breakfast sandwich. Shortly afterwards, two of the regulars that are there came up and talked to me about something and then offered their thoughts about the day that equally just brightened my day and helped me realize that God's grace and love would truly be in the message we share. Over the last month, we've been looking at what it means to follow and trust in Jesus and how we struggle with those things God asks of us as we try to live out our lives in faith we profess. Faith in the love and grace of God revealed in and through Jesus Christ. As our readings have shown us, such struggles are not new. They've been around from the beginning. And one reason for this is that there are just so many different ways that we can live out our faith. That's a pretty good thing if you ask me. Because if we all tried to live out our faith in exactly the same way, 
there'd be a lot in the world that probably wouldn't get done. Now, the letter of James is often referred to as the discipleship book of the Bible. In his letter, James goes beyond just the study of faith in Jesus. Instead, he focuses on what living out our faith in Jesus looks like. Now, some that don't like his letter, because when it's read by itself, read alone, they say it sounds a lot like justification for works righteousness, in which we can earn our salvation through the things we do instead of God's grace. But that's not what James is talking about. What James describes so keenly is that anyone, anyone can profess faith in Jesus as Lord. Anyone can say Jesus is my God, my Lord. But it is through our actions we know whether the faith we profess is real or not. He goes on to say that these actions do not have to be feats of grandeur. Quite the opposite. Because actions such as that draw attention to ourselves as the performer of those actions. Instead of pointing to God. He begins his letter by talking about the little things we do. That bear witness to God's grace in our midst. And one of the simplest things he says we can do is to listen more than we speak and to curb our anger. What would it be like in the world today if more of us could do that more often? Now, listening and holding our tongue can be done apart from faith in Christ. But what makes this an act of discipleship for James is that when we do so, we do so with a respect for one another that is grounded in the love God has made known to us. The foundation James is laying is that our actions bear witness to the truth of our words. If we treat one another kindly and with respect, even in something as simple as just listening to one another, he says this is an outward and visible sign that the faith we profess is faith in God. But in those times when we are harsh with one another, or we speak behind another's back, or we try to elevate ourselves above others, he says this too is an outward and visible sign. But this sign that the faith we profess is just words. Now I don't think it is as black and white as James describes. However, just like Jesus in today's gospel, James does say that our actions describe us more clearly than our words alone. Therefore, we must look at our actions and our inactions, for that matter, to determine what faith we truly hold in our hearts. If it were only that simple. But as we will hear over the months of lessons, living out our faith is more than just being courteous or nice to one another. It requires us to make choices. Choices in how we see one another. How we care for one another. How we help one another. Some of the questions James raises in his letter are, in these choices we face as we live out our faith, do we seek a reward for what we do? We give thanks for the opportunity God has given us. And how do we see our relationship with God in the world? Are our interactions with God individual in nature? Or are 
they part of and in concert with the wider body of Christ? I believe how we answer these questions will determine whether or not we hear James's words over this month as either unreasonable demands or acts of faith that we strive to accomplish. Amen. <laughs>